Hello, and welcome to One World, One Health, where we talk to people working to solve some of the biggest problems facing our world. I'm Maggie Fox. This podcast is brought to you by the One Health Trust, with bite-sized insights into ways to help address challenges such as infectious diseases, climate change, and pollution. A One Health approach recognizes that everything on this planet, the animals, plants and people, and the climate and environment are all linked. We may have just been through a pandemic, but that doesn't mean the threat has gone. Another one is almost certainly coming. Nita Madhav, Senior Director of Epidemiology and Modeling at Ginkgo Biosecurity, has put a number on it. She projects a 50% chance of another pandemic in the next 25 years, probably caused by a respiratory virus like COVID-19 was. It's her job to put numbers on these projections, and Madhav, who's worked with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Emory University, and other similar places known for expertise in these matters, has quite a few numbers. We're chatting with her in this episode about what she sees coming down the road and what the world should be doing about it. Nita, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Pandemic experts have been worrying about the next one for decades. Back in the early 2000s, they put the odds of a flu pandemic in the next 100 years at 100%. They got that right with H1N1 flu in 2009, even if it didn't kill as many people as feared. The really scary one came with COVID, of course. So what do you think is next? Ah, great question. You know, it's impossible to predict the future with so much certainty. We can't tell the exact time and place or even the pathogen that might cause exact next pandemic. But as you mentioned, we can estimate the probability. And so that's the study that we did, which was our analysis was mainly focused around respiratory viruses, namely pandemic, flu, and novel coronaviruses. And we did estimate the probability. So in fact, we estimated that in any given year, there's a 2 to 3% chance of uh, such a pandemic occurring. And that may not sound like a big number, but when you think about it on a time scale, on the time horizon of 10 years or 25 years, and you start to project that number outwards, that's when you get to the estimate that it could be as high as 50% in the next 25 years. And given how we've done that analysis, we actually think that this is a lower bound estimate. There's a lot of factors that may be increasing this number. And unless we really significantly change how we prepare for and respond to these types of threats, we're really looking at a high probability in the coming years. Okay, what are some of the factors you say are increasing the probability? Well, um, there are a few of them. So, you know, right now we have higher levels of global travel. There was a decrease during COVID, but it's, it's coming back up. And then we also have a lot of agricultural practices, humans coming into contact with potential animals, reservoirs that could be causing these diseases to jump into humans. And then we also have the, the threat of global warming that appears to be increasing disease threats for many different diseases out there. And so that's just just a handful of the types of risks that we're tracking right now that may be increasing over time. And in your prediction, you say it's likely to be a respiratory virus. Why is that? Well, it doesn't have to be a respiratory virus, but one of the reasons we focus on these in particular is because there's been an amount of prior research that's shown that there are certain things that make outbreaks difficult to control. And a couple of these factors are how transmissible the pathogen or disease-causing organism is. And then another critical factor is whether or not people can spread the disease before they show symptoms, or even they may never show symptoms, but still spread. And those are some factors that can be very problematic for trying to control an epidemic or pandemic. And so we see this, these types of patterns with respiratory viruses quite a bit. So for example, measles virus is one that comes up a lot that has a, you know, it's highly transmissible and has a respiratory spread component. Uh, but I also want to mention that there's always the potential for surprise. So, you know, one of the things that's predictable is how unpredictable this can be. And so we've seen um, in recent years, the emergence of HIV, of Zika virus, and many other types that could cause cause a, a pandemic. And so we do need to remain vigilant and keep a wide angle view of these potential threats, both known and unknown. 
one major fear has always been influenza. And I guess one reason is that it has two of the big factors, right? It has transmissibility and it can be spread before people show symptoms. But what are some of the other reasons why flu is always the big, big scaredy one? Well, I think there's always the specter of the 1918 pandemic, which some estimates are that it caused up to 5% of the global population to die, which is a very high number. And that percent of mortality is orders of magnitude higher than what we saw during COVID. So even the sheer magnitude is something I think that's constant cause for concern. And so having this demonstrated potential from past events, at least today, we do have more tools in our toolkit. We know what the influenza virus is. We didn't know that in 1918. We have the ability to make vaccines. And so that somehow mitigates it. But uh, some of the factors that I talked about, including the increase in global travel and agricultural practices and things that put us into contact with animals, can really continue to increase this risk. And then we know that the influenza virus has this ability to mutate and shift and could you know, suddenly gain the ability to spread more easily from person to person especially for some of the you know recent emergences like um, H5N1 that there's been a lot of talk about lately. Yeah, let's talk about H5N1 because um, it's moved into some unexpected mammals. It's originally an avian influenza bird flu. What do you think the chances are that it could cause the next pandemic? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but the current behavior of H5N1 is concerning. And the more it spreads, especially the more it spreads within mammals, and the more that gives it more chances to mutate. And as it mutates, as it changes, and it gains a better ability to infect mammals, there's also a greater chance that it can start to affect humans. And in that case, if it gains the ability to spread efficiently from person to person, then it will be hard to stop. And this is the type of thing where we would like to avoid, if we can, kind of nip it in the bud, so to speak. With flu especially, um, there's been a lot of work that's been done over the past decades. And so we do have more experience developing countermeasures, including antiviral drugs and vaccines. But these things will take time to develop and take time to deploy. And so we can't really count on this alone. Prevention and early identification is really the key in getting ahead of such an outbreak. How are we doing on that? Well, you know, I think there's a flurry of activity happening, a lot of concern about how this is being handled, how do we protect the milk supply, things like that. But I think there, you know, other efforts such as wastewater monitoring has shown that this is likely to be more widespread than the current focus is showing. And so really the call is for broader scale monitoring so that we can really understand what's going on. I don't think right now we have a full grasp of that. Is that somehow reassuring? If people aren't dropping dead all over the place, can't we kind of relax a little bit? I wouldn't say it's time to relax. I think it means that it's not too late yet to do something. So I think that's the view that we have to take, that we can't rely on that. It's not, it's because just because the virus is not spreading efficiently right now, it doesn't mean that it won't get the ability to do that in the future. Can we take any comfort from the fact that the, the one person who had been known, at least at the beginning of the spread, to be infected had very mild symptoms? Is that comforting in any way? For me, um, I wouldn't say it was comforting that it showed up in humans, but it does follow a pattern we've seen with other types of these viruses that have uh, been found in, in birds in the past. And so um, at least it kind of follows a known pattern. So that was, uh, that was something that wasn't alarming. But the fact that it showed up in these dairy cattle is something where it's behaving differently. And so anytime a virus behaves differently, it's a cause for concern. So why haven't people done more to, to do a better job of getting on top of this new virus after seeing how bad COVID just was? Well, I think there's a lot of factors at play. I think one of the things was that COVID for many people was a collective trauma for many of us. And so it's understandable that a lot of people have a certain amount of COVID fatigue. People want to move on. They don't want to think about any more pandemics. But I think we also need to make sure to take the opportunity and take the lessons from that pandemic and use that experience to do better next time. 
So I think in some ways we are encouraged uh, seeing that there is a greater emphasis on trying to have better monitoring systems in place. So for example, at Ginkgo, we've had uh, pilots programs and signed MOUs in 14 different countries. And so we do see this, there's this momentum building, people recognizing that we do need better systems in place. So what does Ginkgo do with these memoranda of understanding? Yeah, so the memorandum is um, just a way to signify that we've started to build partnerships with these countries. And the types of programs that we work with countries on span a wide range of different areas of biosecurity. So starting from you know building systems for continuous pathogen monitoring, especially looking at the genomic components of those uh, bacteria and viruses to establish baselines of what's circulating, what's out there, and then that allows us to say what is different and help us to detect things before they become a bigger problem. So right now we have a partnership going on with the U.S. CDC working in uh, several airports around the country. And we also are working with a few other international partners um, on airport uh, programs. And in these cases, we're both having passengers getting voluntary nasal swabs and analyzing those. And then we also are taking aircraft wastewater from different settings and testing them. Um, And then, of course, uh, in addition to building up these programs and working with our country partners there, we're also doing a lot of data and analytics and some of that risk modeling that we talked about earlier. So kind of running the range there on on how we can work with with others on these problems. I think people might remember Ginkgo from the pandemic. Didn't you help the CDC monitor for COVID spread? Yeah, so... During the pandemic, the Ginkgo actually had a couple of different types of programs going. We actually worked on working with with schools and school districts to do testing to help you know keep the uh, classrooms open uh, when when COVID wasn't present. So we had some. I think we served over five thousand schools in that uh, in that program. Um, and then we also did launch our uh, CDC aircraft and airport monitoring program. Was launched during the pandemic and really started out focused on COVID, but then now we've expanded it to other types of diseases as well. What are some of the other diseases we should be keeping an eye out for? Well, that's a great question. So in fact, you know, we, we talked a lot about respiratory viruses earlier, and those are definitely something that we're wanting to keep an eye out for. We've also done some other work looking at other types of pathogens that can jump from animals to humans, including like Ebola virus, Nipah virus, Machupo virus, a lot of the different types of viruses. And um, in that study, we were looking at the trends over time. We found that there's been significant growth so about 5% increase in outbreaks and 9% increase in deaths since we looked at the data starting from the 1960s. And so if we kind of project this forward, this can estimate about a 12 times increase in deaths compared from 2020, not accounting for the pandemic, to 2050. And so that's a pretty significant increase. And it's really just the tip of the iceberg. So there's been other efforts looking at the about 25 important virus families that may be significant for the next um, epidemic or pandemic. And so there's a lot out there. And I don't want to forget to talk about the antimicrobial resistance, especially in bacteria. And again, here, this is estimated to cause over a million deaths a year and is only growing. So a lot of pathogens to keep track of. Can we talk about the math you used to get to this 12 times increase in deaths? Can you talk us through that a little bit? Yes. So that is, um, if we assume that there's a 9% increase in deaths per year, and we use as the base case, we excluded the COVID pandemic because that was a uh, an extreme event. So if we don't include that, then we estimate about a 12-fold increase in the, the number of deaths between 2020 to 2050. And deaths from what? From these particular zoonotic pathogens or pathogens arising from animals that we studied in that paper. So mainly Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Nipah and Machupo virus. None of which now are especially transmissible between people, luckily. They're, they cause such significant disease that they're not spreading undetected. But are you factoring in that, that they might change? Yeah, so that's always a constant danger that we're watching. 
And I think this is an uh, important reason why the we really need genomic surveillance or genomic monitoring of these pathogens so that we can understand when they're changing and really have that early warning that we need to be able to respond as quickly as we can. Are we doing enough, do you think? Well, I'd like to see us doing more. And by us, I mean collectively the world. I think there's still a lot more that we can do. I think COVID was kind of uh, just a trial run for something that could be a lot worse. And I think it was really a wake-up call that we need to have better systems in place. So one thing that's been very important to me lately is really trying to get people to understand the importance of having these continuous monitoring programs. I don't think it's enough to just, you know, start up a, a monitoring program once we see that, you know, something is already here. Like we really need to be able to have this, like constantly know what pathogens are circulating, what's causing disease, and then we'll know what's normal and what's not normal. We really don't have a good idea about that right now, which is kind of crazy to think about. And we do know this. I mean, we knew that once we saw COVID, it was already everywhere. It turned out to be true. By the time it was detected, it was already spreading. Do you sometimes despair of human behavior that we have not figured this out yet? Well, I have to say that I'm often disappointed by the way things turn out. You know, whether it's kind of the wide amount of disinformation and mistrust that's, you know, currently there in the world and just a lot of ways where we could have learned lessons from past events and, you know, failed to really take those lessons and make some meaningful changes. But on the flip side of that, I do consider myself an optimist because I think to really be in public health, you have to have an optimistic nature because you have to believe that things can improve, that you can really make the world a better place. So I think that's ultimately what drives me here. Well, we're grateful that you're here and that you're doing this work. Thank you, Nita, for your work and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. You can learn more about this podcast and other important topics at OneHealthTrust.org. And let us know what else you'd like to hear about at OWOH at OneHealthTrust.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to One World, One Health, brought to you by the One Health Trust. I'm Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, founder and president of the One Health Trust. You can subscribe to One World, One Health on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on social media at One Health Trust, One Word, for updates on One World, One Health and the latest in research on One Health issues like drug resistance, disease spillovers, and the social determinants of health. Finally, please do consider donating to the One Health Trust to support this podcast and other initiatives and research that help us promote health and well-being worldwide. Until next time.